Hello everyone and welcome to a very special international broadcast of Access, Ideas and Insights, UK Perspectives on Art and Disability. I'm Liz Martin, CEO of Accessible Arts New South Wales. And I'm Danielle Galotta, Senior Access Programs Producer at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Before we begin today, we would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to Elders past and present. We extend a warm welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today as well. Today we will hear from our international guests as we explore access, representation and opportunities in the United Kingdom for artists and audiences with disability. In order of appearance, our guests today are award-winning visual and performing artist Rachel Gadsden, Kat Sheridan, Senior Producer of Unlimited, Susie Lark, Visual Artist and Photographer, and Marcus Dickey Hawley, Curator at Access at Tate. Today's event is in collaboration between Accessible Arts and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, supported by the UK Australia Season Patrons Board, the British Council and the Australian Government as part of the UK Australia season. Due to challenges associated with global time differences, the following interviews were pre-recorded this week. We'd really love to hear your responses and your comments on the program today. So please share any questions you have as we have staff from, staff from Accessible Arts and the Art Gallery of New South Wales online to respond to your questions. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy today's international access collaboration. Let us begin with today's first interview, Rachel Gadsden. I had the pleasure of meeting Rachel Gadsden in 2018 at the Unlimited Festival in London, South Bank, and then again in 2019 at Accessible Arts Arts Activated Conference here in Sydney. But for those in our audience, Rachel, who may not yet have met you, can you introduce yourself and give some background of your practice? Hi Liz, it's great to uh, be sat here with you again today. And yes, we did. We met uh, in 2018 and 2019 um, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm a visual artist, I'm a visual and performance artist, and I'm going to rewind that and say I'm a disabled visual and performance artist. And I say that in purely political terms, because I do address the fact that I'm a disabled artist as a political term. And my practice deals with um, issues relating to vulnerability and survival and hope. I am a survivor because of my own condition. And I've always thought that I could address this with the universal context of the human condition and as a result my work has very much become quite a human rights based practice. I'm a socially engaged artist and I reach out to both individuals and communities around the world to try and make sure that important voices are heard. Primarily obviously I have my own practice but I don't ever just want to be talking as an individual because I really believe as a collective, if we come together with our united voices, we have a real chance of bringing cultural change to our society. At the moment, it's not a level playing field. And so often disabled artists are left out of the agenda. And as a disabled person who's always been disabled and who's made through my practice, been able to have you know, quite a substantial career as an artist, I want to make sure that there are many other voices there shouting out and talking about who they are and about their lived experience too. I love your quote um, describing your work as cross-cultural visual dialogues that consider the most profound notions of what it is to be human. Can you speak more about this notion of humanity? What are the themes that you are addressing in your current work? Well, I suppose as an artist and when people look at me, they can see that I don't look like I have any disabilities. Um, I'm both visually impaired and have a very severe medical condition. And 
what I've begun to realise as I've been an artist is it's not about whether I'm a disabled person or not a disabled person. It's about who I am as an individual. And that sense of humanity is the same for everyone who lives and breathes. So when I talk about, I suppose, the human condition and our humanity, it's about trying to, rather than see our differences, see our parallels and where we're, we're really working together as a society. And so that's become a really key point of what I do. And I tend to find that by building dialogues, as opposed to just working independently, not only do I sometimes make really extraordinary work with other people as collaborations, but I also find that it's a bigger voice. And in the last two years, it's been incredibly difficult for disabled people, especially. Mm. I've actually been isolated for two and a half years. And I knew really quickly I didn't want to stop being an artist. So I quickly found out about Zoom, Teams, all of those sorts of things. And started working with artists both in UK and around the world to make sure that in my tiny little studio, I could st still be part of the art world. And that's what's happened. I sort of thought maybe I should do a PhD because I don't know how long I'm going to be stuck in my studio. And uh, very surprisingly was awarded a scholarship to Loughborough University. And my research theme is the politics and mythologies of disability art, sensation and activism. And so within all my work at the moment, whether it's to do with my PhD or with my artistic projects, I'm dealing with notions of freedom and survival, constriction, confinement, all those mm. things that we're all experiencing at the moment, but also ultimately the sense of, you know, we've got to have hope because if you don't have hope, you don't get up tomorrow. And through that, I've been able to work with wonderful Jeremy Hawkes in Australia and Sue Fung in Hong Kong and Disability Arts Hong Kong, just many, many different organisations. And the journey goes on. I just want to dig a little deeper into some of that, Rachel. Um, much of your work, as you've said, is, is involved cultural collaboration and participative programs. How has the last two years of COVID lockdowns and isolation affected your creative practice? What new opportunities have you discovered during this period? It's really interesting because I've always travelled a lot with my work and worked with lots of other people. At the very start of the pandemic, there was a real sense of maybe being able to have some time to address my own practice, very particularly. And I've probably drawn, painted, created performances, done far more of that about my own work than I've probably done in the last five or 10 years. And that's been incredibly invigorating because I suspect that we all at times have to look back in at ourselves to be able to reflect back out again. But there did come a point where I got used to working on Zoom and Teams and being able to be in other people's studios. And I kept a very ongoing relationship with Jeremy and we almost, it was as if we were in a studio together, although we were thousands of miles apart and then began to find ways where we could maybe work with different practices, with sound, music, and really address, address some of the issues that, that were affecting, well, everyone, but particularly, I think, a lot of disabled artists who were finding it very challenging um, to be so isolated, unsupported, without there being any sense of when they would get out of this particular situation. and. We've worked digitally, we've worked through performance. I've done performances in this tiny studio on my own, which is very weird, but it's what's happened. And actually built some, probably some of the most meaningful relationships I've ever had with artists around the world. And probably I'm now in touch with more artists than I think I've ever been in touch with. So there's a way that you can carry on doing it. And I'm not very technical and good at technology at all and I don't have any support and I've managed to do it. So I sort of think maybe other people can do that too. So there, there are loads of ways that you can work together. And recently I've started working with a Dutch artist called Helen uh, Roten. And we've literally in the last two months set up something called Solidarity of Hope, which is working with neurodivergent and artists with very severe mental health vulnerabilities and bringing a 
group of Dutch artists and a group of uh, Welsh artists together where we're building a collective and we all have equal voices within the collective. So it's just onwards. It's trying to unite people together. You were first commissioned by Unlimited 10 years ago for your Unlimited Global Alchemy project. Can you speak to our audience about this project and what role did this opportunity have in your career trajectory? Well, it was probably, you know, one of the most powerful projects um, that I received in 2012. Oh, it was, I actually received it in 2010, but it, it was for the London Cultural Olympiad. And for various reasons, it's a long story, but I reached out to an artist who was an HIV and AIDS survivor and eventually found out that uh, she lived in uh, Kailicha, Nondesumo. And the project was really about, again, coming together with different voices. Nondesumo and her collaborators, the Bambanani group, uh, six other artists, are all kept alive by antiretroviral treatments. And for a long time, they hadn't had any medication, so there wasn't necessarily the sense that they would survive. And I'm injected every minute to keep me breathing and very dependent on medical treatment and the ongoing medical treatment. And I think when I saw Nanda Miso's body map uh, at a museum, I really knew that she had the same sensibility that I had about being alive, being able to survive and wanted to make a project that really addressed these issues. And with the Cultural Olympiad, with the Olympics, you can't do anything that's really political within the opening closing mm -hmm. ceremonies. But through the Unlimited programme, there was a real openness about the type of subject that you might want to address. And so I proposed that I would address this issue around medical treatment, people being able to have medical treatment around the world, that it should be equal, it should be free. Of course, it's not for many people. And I went out to South Africa and collaborated with this amazing group of survivors. And although we come from very different backgrounds, ethnicities, just because of our experience, we felt really as if we were brothers and sisters together. And that wasn't to do with our personal identity, but it was just to do with that, again, sense of humanity. And we created Unlimited Global Alchemy supported really greatly by Unlimited uh, program, but also by the British Council, South Africa, who were really pretty amazing. And they really bent over backwards to make sure that from our initial ideas of maybe me going there, doing this collaboration to eventually bringing three of the artists to UK and really putting on a very huge program, which was both performative and also an exhibition. And it was life changing. It was life changing because obviously I fly with oxygen. I didn't know how I was going to manage being in a different country for six weeks, whether I would be able to cope health wise. So in lots of ways, it was really enlightening for me. And I'd had some incredible opportunities before that. But I suppose it made me realise that human rights was something that I really wanted to tackle. And we've all stayed very close friends together. Sadly, one of the group is no longer with us. So we carry her with us as we journey onwards. Um, but it was a remarkable experience. And then you were part of Unlimited again in 2018. Yes, that's right. I feel very, very lucky. I, I think I've had three commissions from Unlimited yeah. for various, yeah. various large ones and, and a much smaller pilot project. Oh, well, and actually it was um, again with British Council. But I then had the opportunity to go to Palestine uh, with um, working with Suha Kufash and uh, the British Council team there were very supportive. And I worked with a group of disabled artists um, from the West Bank, different parts of the West Bank. And again, it was about sharing stories, sharing who we were. I, I, I suppose my work isn't openly political. I don't fight a government's political stance, but what I do try and address within the themes that I want to engage with or bring other artists in to engage with is to give artists the courage and the opportunity to say, actually, our stories matter. Mm. And actually, if we tell our stories and our stories are out there, then there's a sense that maybe 
governments do start addressing some of the issues that matter. And certainly I know that the project uh, was was really enlightening for the artists that I work with. I worked with in the, in Palestine, and I'm still in again in close touch with all of the artists. So you know, the aim isn't to sort of do a project, drop them, mm. move on. It's it it doesn't work mm. like that. We become a just a growing bigger family as we move forward, and they're now artists creating work, doing exhibitions, doing their own things too. For our Australian artists, Rachel. Um, Australian artists with disability, tuning into this conversation, do you have any insights, advice into navigating the art world? It's really interesting because I think so often artists forget that actually the art world is the most competitive place for anyone, whether you're disabled or non-disabled, it's just how it is. And as a disabled person, I really think that you've just got to really have the biggest courage in the world and just get out there. And to sort of understand that you've got to be a great artist and that's not to do with your disability or not disability, that's to do with it's competitive. The art world is competitive. And you've just got to make sure that your voice is heard. And that can start in a really tiny way. It can start as a blog, it can start through Facebooking, it can start through Instagramming, TikToking, whatever you want but to gradually, bit by bit, make sure that your voice is there. Because what I began to find as my career has gone along the road, some of the opportunities that have come to me have not been the ones I've sought. Mm. Somebody's got in touch with me and said, we want to show your work. Sometimes they are things I've applied for. I applied for Unlimited, you know, it's a competitive process. And these processes are very, very competitive. But if you fail first time, just forget being knocked down. It's not to do with your work. It's to do with a competitive process. Go back in, regather, rechange, do whatever you need to do and carry on. The other thing is that, you know, being an artist is really a lifestyle rather than a part-time job for most people. I mean, I know you're a musician and you also have the role you have um, as a CEO, CEO for an organization. But it is, being an artist is a massive commitment. Mm. And people always say to me, you know, you're such a workaholic. And in fact, I'm not at all, I'm just an artist, but it does take a huge amount of commitment to, to be able to be an artist. Because if you don't have an established practice, mm. then nobody wants to see your work anyway. So I think that, you know, as a disabled artist, there are more barriers but with organisations like Unlimited, with the British Council, with Arts Council, with you know the same organisations you have in Australia, there are ways forward. And I, I actually think we have to make sure that we're there, functioning in such a way that we can we can do what's necessary. You know, being disabled isn't the excuse. In fact, it's the empowerment. You've got another story to tell that needs to be told. So get out there and tell that story. As I said, I identify as being disabled. I don't feel disabled. I don't look disabled because I just don't. But until disabled voices have the same level playing field as everyone else, I will say I'm disabled because change has got to happen. And I want to be that person who's contributing to that change. Thanks, Rachel, for your time today. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Here I am now with Kat Sheridan and Susie Larks. Um, Kat, would you like to introduce yourself for the Australian audience, please? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Kat Sheridan. My pronouns are she, her. I am a queer and neurodivergent producer based in Glasgow and the new senior producer for Unlimited. So I have been working in disability arts and mainstream arts and socially engaged arts for around 13 years across the UK. But for the last sort of nine or 10 years, I've been based in Scotland and joining the new independent Unlimited as senior producer has been a, yeah, a really exciting move because we have a geographically dispersed team and really exciting plans coming up for the next few years. So thank you so much for having me. And Susie Lark, would you like to introduce yourself, please? 
So hi, hi everyone. So I'm Susie Lark and I'm a photographer. Um, I'd call myself a fine art stroke creative portrait photographer. And I do a lot of work around mental health and trying to depict that through imagery. Um, so I'm based in South Wales. Um, I have been a photographer for, gosh, like sort of since leaving university. I graduated in 2002, off and on. Worked in Spain, lived in Spain for 10 years. Um, moved back to Wales um, about seven years ago. Um, I used to be a commercial photographer and it's in the last sort of seven, six, seven years that I've been using a sort of new fine art approach and also, um, I suppose, uh, manipulating my images and um, making imagery that's not sort of standard photo, but more digital art. So, um, yeah, that's me. Nice to meet everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here, Susie. Um, Kat. Unlimited recently underwent a significant structural transition. Can you talk to our audience about Unlimited, how this, is, this commissioning model was established and what your future direction is? Absolutely. So yes, you are correct. We have just become an independent organisation ourselves. It's very exciting. Um, Unlimited was previously a programme of work. So it came out of the Paralympics in 2012 and then was delivered by two delivery partners in London. So that's Shape Arts and Arts Admin. And it was very much in an annual programme delivery model. So year on year, how do we get commissions and money into the hands of disabled artists as quickly as possible? Um, the team went through a kind of reflection stage and the brilliant Joe Verrant, who was senior producer and is now our new director, decided, no, we need to take the step to become independent and have a longer term vision and strategy. So we are now a registered charity um, and holding our breath with our MPO application going in. Uh, but we have had a chance to look at the whole model and go, OK, what is possible now in terms of commissioning with a broader horizon? So we have a brand new board on board, which uh, they're fantastic, majority disabled led. We have a brilliant team, some who have come over from old uh, Unlimited and some brand new recruits like myself. And we've been going alongside commissioning which is very much the core of what we do how can we support disabled artists and the disabled art sector in a wider way so we've brought in a strand called the develop which is going to be looking at developing the skills of current disabled artists and our alumni we've built in a much stronger um, shape of support for disabled artists so they can make the work they want to make and pushing the sector and society to improve we are really heavily investing in connects and connecting up the industry both nationally and internationally and all of this work, including the commissioning, feeds into our overarching goal, which is about changing the sector for the better through resources, campaigns and advocacy. Kat, as senior producer, you are responsible for the delivery of programmes, projects and strategic partnerships. Can you talk about what you feel are some of the most exciting innovations happening in the sector and how your programming responds to this? Yes, it's a really strange question, isn't it? Because there has been quite a lot of innovation over the past few years, but that feels like it's come out of a necessity of a global pandemic almost more than anything else. Um, and I don't think we can forget that, particularly with our disabled-led team and the disabled artists we commission, the pandemic is very much still ongoing. Um, and so there's been a huge kind of innovation or swing towards streaming hybrid events, online tech. Um, and there's been some really exciting kind of innovations that have come out of that. One of the platforms I came across is um, accessibleloop.com. I don't know if you know it, it's a subscription service. It's a really fantastic new platform that allows you to put sign language and live human captioners or closed captions onto live streams and virtual events. So it's really, really easy and it can do multi-language, real-time captions. Um, that's been really exciting to discover. But also just watching Disabled artists do what they do best, which is innovate and challenge because we've always had to because of the systems and the kind of ableist oppression in place. Come to technology and platforms like Zoom, which we all know and love, and find ways to flip that and find ways to play with that. It's been really exciting to watch, in my opinion. Um, and I think there's definitely a feeling within the disabled arts community in the UK anyway, that we're not quite ready to let go of that. There's more to explore, that it's not perfect yet. 
Um, and so the intersection between, I guess, the creative industries and tech is becoming more and more tangible and exciting within that sector. Um, but in terms of our programs, we've we've looked at, OK, how can we provide sustained, sustained support? So during the pandemic, it was just about, again, get that money out. But now those works have been created. How can we bring them to a wider digital platform? So our um, partnership with the South Bank Centre is kept going ahead this year again with the Unlimited Festival, which is a, a kind of international international festival which has usually in-person work but last year was online this year we are investing in having at that hybrid model so what's happening with international delegates in person what can be accessed from anywhere around the world what work has already been created that doesn't actually need any shifting or changing and can be experienced by a whole range of people that otherwise wouldn't and how do we honor socially engaged uh sorry socially distanced performance work in a digital way if it needs to be in person all of those questions are kind of coming out so it is very exciting but it also feels like a real responsibility and weight around it to get it right and to not let go of some of those innovations that we've seen pop up as a form of necessity really unlimited's impressive catalogue of commissioned work raises the profile of artists with disability and challenges perceptions of disability can you speak about the commissioning process, how artists are selected, and what opportunities you provide artists with disability? So our commissioning process is kind of the foundation of our work. And I think people know us for holding an open commissioning process, which we're very much keeping moving forward. But whereas previously we've had partner awards, as we call them, so commission opportunities with partner organisations mixed in with a kind of open ended apply with whatever idea you have. We're now moving to a biennial model where we have one year of partners and one year of open. We've also decided to absolutely scrap the kind of, um, I guess, framework of emerging R&D and main awards because we were really getting strong feedback from artists that they just didn't know what those things meant anymore. Am I emerging if I've been in the industry for 10 years? What does it mean to have a main award versus an R&D when actually I'm going to need to R&D this before it gets to Maine. All of that feedback was really heard. Mm -hmm. And so this year we are running partner awards, which we'll um, announce in July and open in October. And they will be for under £25,000, British UK pounds, and over 25000 And we are saying that if you're applying for under twenty five k, we don't necessarily expect there to be a fully realised beautiful output that is ready to tour straight away but we're not bracketing it within that idea of being R&D or necessarily emerging artists and similarly for over 25,000 we are saying we hope to within the idea see that um, there's some, there's work there that will be able to tour or exhibit or exist beyond our commission and beyond that investment. Of course with partner awards there is always criteria which the partners bring in whoever they may be uh, can't give that away at the moment um, but there are some really exciting partners coming on board this year and they will come into the traditional model in terms of our first stage and second stage applications which has been designed to support kind of the um, the need for as little labour as possible in the first instance. So we're really aware that artists do a huge amount of unpaid labour when they're doing applications. And that is why Unlimited has always said, put your idea down and send it over to us in that first stage. The important thing is the clarity of that idea, not how, not the budget, not the access yet, just what do you want to do? We then bring together a panel to assess that independently. And that is in partner years made up of 50% of the partners themselves. So all of the partners who are putting match funding under 25 will be in one and over 25 in another. And then, of course, we have independent disability representation there. So that's disabled artists, disabled leaders, voices in the room that can speak to the process and the access and the need. Um, that will do a short listing of stage one. And then we will work with the artists who go on to stage two in order to develop that application. So that's where they get an hour of our time at Unlimited to talk through not the artistic quality of what's being included. We never comment on that. But actually, have you thought about access for yourself within this? Have you thought about access for your audience? What is the um, what are the kind of practicalities potentially this year working with this partner that you may or may not have thought about? Um, and that's to give people the best chance they possibly can. We want people to be successful and, and bring their best ideas forward in a realistic way. You know, there's always a worry that artists actually 
apply for less money than is potentially needed for an idea and sort of stretch their own resources. And we really want to get away from that as much as possible. So that's our main kind of focus on commissioning. But we also have things like the British Council Micro Awards, which are opening in June and July, which are awards of £2,500 uh, for UK based artists to connect with artists in older countries who maybe have a connection, but have never had any money to develop on that. So it might be a conversation or the sketching out of an idea over Zoom. Um, and that's a kind of great feed into uh, a longer term, I guess, relationship, which may or may not fit into the opportunities the partner awards provide this year. So that's just a snippet of our kind of current commissions. We also do things like strategic commissions and um, connects commissions and showcasing. But they're sort of longer term plans that we'll be announcing later. Fabulous. Thanks, Kat. Susie. Unlimited commissioned your photographic project titled Unseen, where you used fine art photography to depict mental health experiences. Can you talk to us about this incredible project and your approach to collaboration? Yeah, so my, my project Unseen is, at the heart of it, is about um, trying to find visual language to illustrate experiences of struggles with mental well-being and try and um, take an experience which um, can often be felt to be difficult to communicate um, difficult to put into words and and it, and uh, channel it to externalize and to make sense of these experiences to put them into um, an image mm -hmm. to communicate what goes the uh, I suppose the internal world to get that out um, and and yes and by showing this work publicly um, to to communicate it to you know a wider audience um, in the hope that it might resonate with other people in the hope that it might connect with other people um, and in so doing um, maybe that it would help other people to connect with them um, that they might have had a similar experience or that they you know that they at least can connect with that and perhaps feel reassured uh, feel better that they're not the only people out there feeling that or some that kind of thing um, so um, importantly the, the project is very much uh, about collaboration um, and and I worked with um, in in the end I worked with twenty people um, and uh, my role was not just photographer but facilitator so it was working with people and um, using them as sort of the experts in their experience asking them how they would like to be photographed. Um, giving them the choice of location, um, general idea, um, and then taking those those ideas and then helping them with the logistics of how would you do that and encouraging people to be as um, out there with their ideas as they wanted to um, and really expressing to them that there really was no sort of um, boundaries in terms of um, their imagination. Um, and yeah, and, and like I say, working with the logistics of making these ideas work and um, part of the work that I do, um, my approach to the work is to try and make it look as real as possible. Um, and um, playing with that fine line between the possible, the impossible and trying to make it look like a, a real photograph, even though they're composites. Um, and uh, in doing, I, I tend to use natural light quite a lot. Um, but um, yeah, making something, I suppose, tangible out of difficult experiences. Yeah. Unlimited has been an instrumental creative platform for disabled artists. What do you think the impact has been for artists with disability and for the broader arts community? Yeah, and it's, for me, um, I think that uh, generally the disabled artists 
I think have been marginalized, have been um, underrepresented. And my experience in terms of uh, the work that I do when I first uh, started out um, looking for places to exhibit my work, because I come from a commercial background, this was something that was completely foreign to me is, well, how do you get an exhibition? How do you, how do you contact a gallery? You know, um, I had no idea about, you know, sort of writing a proposal and things like this. Um, but as part of my sort of research into becoming an, an art photographer, um, I asked, you know, friends and colleagues um, about who, who, friends of mine from university who are working in London, quite successful photographers, um, you know, where, where do you show work? How do you contact a gallery? And to, I was quite surprised that the, the response was, well, I don't know where you would show that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and they suggested that, I don't know, maybe I contact Mind, um, a mental health charity. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, the idea that um, that work that's made by disabled artists or that is about mm -hmm. barriers or difficulty um, should somehow not be in the, the public mm. domain and not be um, in the mainstream doesn't make sense to me. So um, really working with Unlimited, um, it, it, it was finding that support team that would go, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll support you. We'll commission this project. We'll show your work. And also, you know, with um, giving giving you that sort of helping hand, that confidence to go, yeah, and your work is worthy of being in the South Bank Centre, which I never imagined, not in a minute, you know, when I first started out um, on this new path of photography, never imagined I would have my work on the South Bank Centre, absolutely not. So it really... Um, it, it, that encouragement to say, well, sure, yeah, this should be, this is work that's in the mainstream, let's get it out there. Um, because at the end of the day, I, I think one of art's purposes is is, is, is to comment on the human condition. So, you know, why, why not? Um, yeah. What impact has Unlimited Commission had on your career? Ma well, Unlimited has a massive <laughs> impact on my career. Um, as I was saying, I mean, firstly, very much, I think, um, the, the support, the helping me with the, I think, the confidence, the belief, and and the reassurance to say, as I was saying, yeah, your work um, should be um, in mainstream. Um, and not just, you know, mainstream, but sort of, like, I think uh, in terms of my, um, um, oh, what's the word? Um, oh, what is the word? Hang on a second. The kinetic so, um, um What's the word? When you're striving for something, it's kind of like your Not ambition. Yeah, oh, yes. So, yeah. So, giving you that ambition. So, Unlimited is, is, has been really helpful to build my confidence, to give me the ambition, to make me see um, a lot further than I had previously seen. Um, I mean, also testament to what Unlimited has done for my career. I'm, I'm currently here in Toronto at four in the morning <laughs> um, because I've got my work at the Harbourfront Centre. Um, again, this is something that when I first started out on this journey, I would have never imagined that as um, you know, the snowball effect from showing my work with Unseen for having the opportunity um, to show with the Unlimited Festival at South Bank Centre, then having that platform that other um, you know fantastic galleries would then contact me and say, "Hey, we've seen your work as part of the Unlimited Festival. Mm -hmm. Would you like to show with us?" And it's crazy when you get emails like that, and you're like. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you very much for asking. So, um, yeah, I'm currently have my work um, 
both inside and outside in the Harbour Front Centre as part of the Commotion Festival, which champions uh, deaf and disabled arts. Um, and and which is mind blowing. And it, I think the exhibition is going to be up for about a month. We just saw the photos today and they're printed like four meters, four and a half meters by three. They're huge. They're massive prints. And it was an absolute delight to go and see that. Um, and when I get back um, from here at the start of May, I also have an exhibition in, in Cologne in Germany. Um, as part of um, a festival called um, uh, Summer Blut and um, Kulte Festival. So it's this, I think it's translated as Summer Blood Culture Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's really exciting as well. Again, as a result of having my work out there. Um, yeah, so it's it's great <laughs> it's wonderful and congratulations and it's um Thank so you. fabulous to hear hear the great outcomes um from limited unlimited and that opportunity and um and who would have thought that you'd be you know speaking to australia at 4 30 in the morning <laughs> i know right it's just it's just crazy you know what as well my brother ben uh, lives in sydney and i was messaging him <laughs> It's really, it's so wonderful that you could join us, Aunt Susie. Uh, Kat, one last question for you. What do you see as the creative highlights of this program of Unlimited? And who are the other rising stars that we should be looking out for? This is such a hard question because I'm 100% yeah. biased. I think the artists we yeah. work with are just gorgeous and phenomenal. But I think... Out of the, the last commissioning round, which is the one I can speak to, um, there are some really exciting people coming through. Uh, Laura Fisher, for example, uses she, her pronouns. They are a phenomenal kind of visual artist and dancer based in Scotland. Again, I'm biased um, because I'm based in Glasgow at the moment. And they've created this piece called Forged in the Tender Heart of Your Embrace, which explores their relationship to these gorgeous physical copper pieces in gallery spaces and it's a durational piece it's just incredible and they're in chronic pain it's it's a really exciting piece that is going on to kind of do various bits of touring at the moment and um excited to see where that goes we've got people like uh jamisha prescott again uses she they as a visual artist um created a piece for us do i look okay to you and they were exploring black identity and chronic pain um, and again, that piece is really exciting to see where it grows and goes. But we've got artists that we shortlist and don't necessarily make it to commission that are also doing incredible things. So Jack Hunter, uh, he, him is a performance artist and he's also a playwright, has just come off a tour with Grey Eye and is taking his own solo work to the fringe. So there really is just a wealth of amazing kind of rising stars, I guess, coming through despite everything that we've had for the past two years. And I'm even more excited to come and see what happens in this next partner award round, considering that the British Council Micro Awards, for example, have been running in the background. And so these partnerships, these relationships may start to emerge in different ways as we, yeah, as we go forward throughout the year. But as I said, I'm biased. I think all of our artists that we see, and most of them that we can't even commission because we do not have the capacity to commission everyone. The work itself is still fantastic. So I think there's a lot to watch in Disability Arts happening right now. Fabulous. And we look forward to seeing and hearing more. Thank you both for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Marcus Dicky Hawley, it's so lovely to have you here with us today. Um, I wonder if you'd mind introducing yourself for the audience. Yeah, so hello, everybody. So my name's Marcus, and I work at uh, the Tate Galleries in London, United Kingdom, where my role there is Curator of Access Programmes. It's a part-time role. I work two days a week and my responsibility and remit is to deliver access programmes across Tate Modern and Tate Britain, which is the original Tate Gallery, 125 years old. The Tate is a cultural institution that was established 125 years ago. How has your approach to access changed over the years and what do you now see as access priorities in the arts? Yes, certainly. Well, I can speak for the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, looking back at the history of Tate and, and what we have in our archives, there was already an interest in access back in the 1980s. 
and the, the Tate Gallery, which nowadays has been rebranded and renamed Tate Britain, um, put on an exhibition in the 1980s around touch, which specifically addressed and was interested in the access needs of blind and partially sighted audiences. So although not an exhibition specifically for blind people, it was an exhibition that everybody, including blind people, could participate in. Um, mainly large, robust, very, very strong, indestructible sculpture, um, which of course is part of what Tate shows, but by no means all of what Tate shows. So um, since I took on the role of curator of access projects, um, my priorities have been around um, inclusion. So first of all, looking at audiences and how previously excluded audiences might be welcomed uh, at the Tate Galleries um, by the provision of programs, events, talks, workshops, which are specifically created with and for disabled people. Um, so in those 16 years, we've gone from working with small audiences to um, growing and growing the program um, and certainly by the end of the sort of 2017 to 19 period, we had developed large, loyal, regular audiences of in-gallery uh, audience participants. Um, we were running something like 50 public events per year and working with um, disabled people in the delivery um, and the creation of those events as well. Then suddenly we went into a kind of a two year COVID restriction. Um, so to bring you right up to date, we are emerging now from a period where we were rethinking how we could engage with audiences um, other than by in gallery events. Mm. Um, yeah. And now we're, I'm calling this our bounce back year. And in 2022 to 23, we are um, revisiting the kind of events we were delivering before COVID, but adjusting, rethinking and using this space that we've got to, to really think about the various different ways in which we could be contacting and working with audiences. In the past, you have collaborated with disability arts organisation Shape Arts and disabled artists Rachel Gadsden and Jesse Darling. Can you talk to us about your approach to the support and representation of disabled artists? Yes, so um, the way Tate works with all artists, including disabled artists, um, very much depends on the, the team um, that, is, that is working with the artists. So for example, in my role, I work within a learning team. And so the way I work with disabled artists is in the commissioning of artists to either deliver programs and events for audiences or to create um, displays that comment on an aspect of, of a subject that we're particularly interested in addressing through the access program. So for some examples of these might be when we worked with Rachel, Rachel Gadsden, um, in Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. And um, Rachel and a, a wide number of different ar architects and artists were commissioned um, in a disorderly architecture program um, to look at Tate Modern's Turbine Hall and to create some interventions. Um, and one of those was a huge live action painting that, that Rachel created. Um, similarly, we looked at the architecture of the building and disabled architects um, intervened in uh, architectural structures like, for example, the ramp, the changing places facility and so on. So that's one way in which we've worked with disabled artists. Um, we've also worked with visually impaired artist Sally Booth um, on a small exhibition space. Um, sometimes we get the chance to display work within the learning program. Um, but on a wider um, relationship with disabled artists, we have a curatorial team who work in parallel with the learning team. And it's that curatorial team perhaps who decide what kind of gets to go on the walls um, and then back to the learning team for interpretation around that. So for example, um, how would a visitor know 
which artists in the Tate displays are disabled. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting idea. Um, sometimes it's evident in the content of the work. But sometimes it's more evident in perhaps biographical information about the artist. So we have an interpretational team who, cur who curate and create the uh, panels that go next to every um, artwork which is on display. And that may or may not refer to an artist's disability status, depending on the, re the relevance of that information to uh, the theme of the room or, or what the curators want to say about the story that's being told. Uh, within the exhibition displays. And then also we have specific spaces within Tate, which are all about exchange, um, exchange between the public, between Tate's kind of collaborators uh, and uh, the curatorial and the learning teams. And that's a very interesting place for experimental programming and shape in particular have been very um, significant in coming to, for example, Tate Modern, taking over the Tate Exchange floor for a period of a week at a time and just bringing in artists to create events, uh, installations, uh, discussion for a forum and all kinds of opportunities for um, a more inclusive, a more experimental and a wider range of programming to happen, which I feel then has a significant impact on Tate's culture. You know, the curators who get to decide what goes up on the wall, see, experience and uh, hopefully participate in the in the programmes that we're running and can see what the appetite is and can just see who the audience is. So that when Tate puts huge banners outside its buildings that say things like Tate for all, mm. it can actually then live up to that promise. What are the highlights of Tate's current access programs and what do you consider to be best practice in access and inclusion for arts audiences? Yes, so since we kind of reopened after this um, period of pandemic, um, as I said earlier, we have had the opportunity to think again about how we want to and how we should be engaging with our audiences. And that's all of our audiences, not just disabled visitors. Um, so we are continuing in the program on which I work to deliver uh, a, a, a continuation of the program of audio description tours, touch tours, British Sign Language tours. Uh, and these were the very successful events that took place going right the way through until the temporary pause in our programming that we've just experienced. Um, but we are starting those up again under slightly different terms. Mm. So, for example, um, I'm calling this a bounce back year again, and the way in which we're welcoming visitors back to the gallery is slightly different to the way we did it before. It's with far more care and personal touch. Um, a lot of people have been shielding, um, have been uh, perhaps reluctant to travel out across London and particularly perhaps for blind and partially sighted people, the requirement to touch things um, over the last sort of 18 months or so has been a challenge. Mm. You know, using the London Underground, it's impossible to travel from A to B without putting your hands on all kinds of surfaces. Mm. Um, and that may be a reason why people have been, you know, dependent on other ways of engaging with the gallery. Um, so um, our events now are all about the kind of the welcome process, working with Tate's wider teams of uh, visitor engagement staff to make sure that when people come to an event at the gallery, there are welcoming staff at the doors, um, that people can be escorted, guided through to a room where we'll have refreshments, where we'll meet the team. Um, everybody knows who's in the room. And then we'll move on to the galleries for a period of time spent discussing as a group of people um, a theme within the collection displays. And then after that, we'll return to our studio space. We'll have some what did you think of that time? And then some personal care around getting people um, to their onward journey. So an event at Tate is not just about coming along, enjoying a talk and leaving knowing more than you came with. It's about a social occasion 
in which you've met a, a group of, of Tate staff, you've met other people, um, you know who's in the room, and you've had the chance to discuss, share opinion and exchange ideas um, in, a, in a safe and careful space. So that's how we're sort of improving the, the live visit. But I'm also um, realising that we need to do more than that. We need to engage with not just local audiences, but national and international audiences, because perhaps one of the benefits of this lockdown is that we have become far more international through the use of digital platforms. So we're working on how we can improve, enhance and deliver more digital offer. And one program that we're working on at the moment is something which we're calling the Audio Description Library. And what we've done is that we've received a large amount of funding um, to create short films which are about to go up onto Tate's website. And these are audio descriptions of a number of key works from the collection displays. Um, delivered in a slightly unusual way. So traditionally, audio description had always been done by trained vocal actors with super clear speech following a script. What we've decided to do is work with people who work at Tate in different positions, either as front of house staff or in other kind of areas of the gallery. And having been trained by Vocalize, um, who are one of uh, the United Kingdom's leading audio description providers. These work colleagues are scripting and then vocally delivering the audio descriptions. So we're getting a wide range of voice types and representation in the audio descriptions themselves. And the works we're choosing are perhaps not the kind of works which have had loads and loads of platform in the past. So um, a new way of delivering audio description, which we're about to launch as an audio description library in, uh, in sort of spring, early summer 2022. And then the other thing that we're thinking of is an, what we're calling an always on offer. So it's all very well coming along to Tate when we're running a programme, but we're reaching perhaps 20, 30, 40 people per event. And we know that statistically there are more than that number of disabled people who are engaging with Tate, either through visits or through our online provision. So what we're doing is that we're working with the front of house team on training skills such as disability confidence, visual impairment awareness and uh, touch tours. So that our ambition is that anybody coming to the gallery without booking will be able to link up with a member of staff who works at the gallery for some kind of engagement opportunity. How is Tate forward planning for access and inclusion in light of COVID and the changing nature of audiences and participation? Yes, so this period of pause uh, mm -hmm. has given us time to reflect on who our audiences are. Are we reaching all the audiences that we have the potential and capability to do? And one audience that we would like to work more with is an audience of neurodivergent people. People with, for example, um, a neurodivergence on the spectrum ranging from, for example, autism, through anxiety, through OCD. Um, people for whom a visit to the gallery may or may not be um, something that they would enjoy, depending mm -hmm. on the range of experiences and the visiting story of coming to see us. You know, all of our four galleries are located in either major cities or in the case of Tate St. Ives, a small seaside town. But for the other three galleries, for Tate Modern, Tate Britain and Tate Liverpool, coming to see us involves making quite a significant and sometimes difficult journey. When you actually get to our galleries, you can experience quite loud, noisy environments with loads of signage, with loads of do not enter this way only, loads of instructions because, you know, we've had to introduce all kinds of one way systems and restrictions on the way people use our buildings. These are being lifted now. Um, but nevertheless, we see an opportunity to make the visiting experience for neurodivergent audiences even better. So there are two ways we can do that. We can, first of all, create visiting opportunities which are specifically reserved for neurodivergent people and their families. 
And we've been doing that actually with the um, Yayoi Kusama Infinity Rooms mm. exhibition that we have at Tate Modern. Now, this exhibition is a, a quite a tight space of pavilions that the public are invited to walk into and experience a sensory environment. Um, the restriction we have is around the number of people we can get through these spaces. Um, and so it's a ticketed exhibition space with tickets sold out like months in advance. Um, and a bit of disappointment, to tell you the truth, for visitors who turn up on the day and can't get into the exhibition. So to address that, I programme bi-monthly access hours in which for two hours at the end of the day, uh, we have a ticket slot which is reserved exclusively and only for people who would self-define as being neurodivergent. And that's accompanied by a creative activity on the concourse, um, by its staff, by a team of visitor assistants who have had neurodivergence awareness training. Um, we make sure that the environment is particularly calm, um, that there's not loud broadcast noise, um, that we have quiet spaces ear defenders and non-verbal ways of communicating with the Tate team. So that's a new program which we've introduced for this exhibition, but which has been so successful that I've got every confidence that it's going to actually um, influence and affect the wider Tate culture around exhi uh, visiting exhibitions. So working with the visitor experience team at all the Tate galleries, I'm hoping that the success of this program um, means that rather than having to program special hours, um, a greater awareness of neurodivergence um, will uh, influence the way all our visitors can benefit from those small changes happening in the way um, we can invite people to visit the galleries and their exhibitions. Fabulous. Thanks so much for your time today, Marcus. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. And you know, if anybody watching this is, is in London in the future, please do come and visit the galleries, um, see what you think, feed back to us any ideas that you have about how we could be making improvements. Because although I've had the opportunity here to talk quite um, proudly about what we're doing, there is no such thing as complete access. You know, And if you have this conversation with me again in five years time, um, I really would expect to be able to explain and expand on a far wider range of things which we can do further along in our forward history. That's fabulous. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks very much. Thank you too. Well, that concludes our program for today, our Access, IDs and Insight broadcasts. Liz, the motivation for today was really to create an event to share with our, our Australian audiences a better understanding of some of the international pursuits around this space of arts and disability. It was so generous how our speakers today shared their experiences and their insights for us to discuss, debate and learn more from them. Uh, on behalf of Accessible Arts and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, we would like to thank the support from UK Australia Season Patrons Board, the British Council and the Australian Government as part of the UK Australia Season. Finally, we'd like to thank you today for joining in and being part of this conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please do share these with us. You can contact Accessible Arts on info at aarts.net.au or the Art Gallery of New South Wales on artmail at ag.nsw.gov.au. Thank you, Liz. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, everyone. Bye.